Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we're here with Heather and Anne, and we're here to talk about striving styles. This is a neuropsychological model that helps you understand development through a Jungian and MBTI lens. And so I'm excited to go through your personality system with you both. And so without further ado, I will let Heather and Anne introduce themselves. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Joyce. So we're so excited to be here. And it's always a pleasure to, to uh, be in an audience or with an audience and speaking to an audience that loves uh, all things Jungian and MBTI in the same way that we do. Um, my background and, and our ands and our background, we've been working together for 25 years. Uh, we primarily work with organizations, leaders and individuals who are really looking at um, achieving their potential in, in whatever means and whatever that looks like. But we've always based our work off of originally in the early days, the MBTI. Um, and then through work that Anne started to do, we evolved that into the striving styles to bring in a more holistic look of really understanding brain, how the brain actually develops, and also bringing in more of that emotional component to it, emotional drivers, behavior, and emotional intelligence. By way of introduction to myself, I've had a passion for um, all things Jungian um, through my psychotherapy training, and I've been a Myers-Briggs practitioner since the early 1980s. And it was it was through the uh, the evolving of um, out out there in the world of information about the brain and and these um, functions that with Young's brilliance, knowing that we had these mental functions before we could actually see them, he he recognized that they were there. And then through um, te technology, we can now see these neural networks in the brain where the con cognitive functions reside. And and I, I, just to add to what Heather said. We worked a lot with both emotional intelligence and and the MBTI in our in private practice and and with our leadership development practice. And what we found was that by blending the two, by looking at both those co the cognitive functions that the MBTI reveals, as well as linking them to the emotional drivers of behavior, why people behave the way they do and what emotions drive them, that leaders could really understand what needs they were satisfying in their work, as well as what their employees needed and how their, their employees needed to be led in order for their needs, their unique diverse needs, very different from leaders most of the time, and, and so be, being able to blend the two into one system was really effective for them. Very cool. And I know audience members will ask about your personality types. So for those curious individuals, Anne identifies as an INTJ and Heather has ENTP preferences. And so in their system striving styles, they include something called predominant needs, which is each cognitive function's core need. So for instance, for someone who leads with extroverted thinking, an ENTJ or an ESTJ, their primary need is control. And so I thought that was a beautiful way of putting it. And for the FI dominance, the INFP and the ISFP, their predominant need is creativity. And so that's why there's this desire to be creative. So sometimes they can purposefully put themselves in an angsty state in order to satisfy that need for creativity. That explains the romanticization, that explains the other behaviors that are stereotypically associated with FI doms. They all make sense because it, it comes from a core need of creativity. And so I was wondering if you could tell us the core needs of the other types. You can also go through your presentation as well, if that also addresses it too. So, so I think before we get into talking about sort of the needs, I, I just to sort of connect all of this up to the four functions, because that's what's at the root of of all of this. And um, you know, in in taking Young's theory, and you know, again, the assessment uh, that Myers and, and Briggs developed to help us sort of understand how we use these four functions um, is, you know, we look at it from the perspective that we've got two of the functions that are rooted in our rational, our cerebral brain. So the defining or the thinking function, so which is a deciding function 
or the interpreting uh, intuitive function, uh, which is the, um, you know, the, the N in our, for those of us that have uh, intuition within our, our four letter code. And then two of these brain functions are down in the emotional brain. Um, so the experiencing or the sensing function that we work with, um, and then the relating or the feeling function, again, using that, the Myers-Briggs language. And, and why we started with this is that, you know, if we actually transition off of the functions to really think about the fact that we've got these quadrants in our brain and each one of those quadrants plays a particular role in our personality and our behavior and that you know they're wired differently right there's neurological networks that are established where our predominant function is a hundred times more efficient from the time of birth and then we actually have to work to build the networks as we move out of our predominant function into our secondary uh, third and ultimately in the fourth and with the reason why we created this model and then i'll move into to you know and, and Anne can talk about the needs um was that what we found in the work that we were doing not just with our clients but even for us personally like I, i'm an entp as you mentioned right so that means i've got my you know interpreting or my intuitive function as my predominant and then i've got the defining or the introverted thinking function as my secondary and when I would do the MBTI, um, I would score zero on my feeling function. So I was 100% on the thinking side and zero. And, and I, didn't, I knew what that meant and from a behavioral perspective, but I didn't understand what that meant from a development perspective and, and the why behind my behavior, right? So why do I behave that way? Because if I understand the why, then I'm in a better place to actually start to develop out relative to that understanding. Um, and so this really helping people to see the functions in this visual way then they can start to imagine kind of what part of their brain they're working out of when they're using these different functions, whether they use it in an extroverted or an introverted way. So I'll pass it over to Anne and she can talk about, I'll just bring up the slide with the, um, the striving styles and their needs and she can speak to um, that piece of it. So he, here we have it broken down into the eight striving styles in, in the four functions and as, as we're all familiar with, the audience is likely familiar, we either extrovert a function or we introvert a function. Um, and there are no pure introverts or extroverts, but the function that we lead with is most likely to determine how we engage in the outer world and how we're perceived by others. And, and so I'm going to start talking about, uh, I'll talk first about the two deciding functions, and then I'll talk about the two in uh, information gathering functions that we have. And we always start with the leader function, the extroverted thinking um, the, in, that resides, um, this neural network um, resides in the upper left rational brain. So it's part of the, the left brain network and it helps with the deciding and the defining of the world. And so the leader doesn't set out to control everybody else and that need to be in control simply means that I want to be in control of my feelings. I want to be in control of my experience. I want to build the world the way I believe the world should be. And because it's um, it's an extroverted thinking, their way of defining is simply by if they believe and they decide that they're right and they know how to do it, well, they're going to lead with that. The introverted um, thinking function, it, it's, it's very interesting because their way of controlling is, is through controlling knowledge. And so they need to be knowledgeable. They're not looking to control the, their outer world they have their inner, as we're familiar with INTPs and ISTPs, they have their internal system for governance, self-governance that they make all of their decisions around and they decide what information is useful and what information isn't useful based on their criteria for being knowledgeable. They're very focused on, on um, becoming the expert because information to them is power. We call this the, the um, power qu quadrant of the brain because of the need to be in control for, for both, but with the intellectual, because it's internal, 
they control the information and they make decisions about who's worth talking to or not based on whether they deem them smart enough and whether they want to spend time with them. Um, the feeling function, making them making their decisions on on their own values, this is the function of the brain because it's connected to the emotional uh, limbic brain. They're more wired into the physiology. And so you'll often hear them say, I feel like I want to do this, or I feel this is the right way to do it. But they're actually making decisions all the time based on, on their criteria, which of course is value. And so the extroverted feeling, they look out into the world and these social leaders connect. They have a predominant driver in, and predominant need to be connected. And these people, you want to, you want to find a plumber, you want to find a community to, to be in. These, these people know people through their primary form of bonding through communicating with others. Artists have a different way of communicating. They communicate internally and they bond internally based on their need to create a perfect ideal environment that they can live in because these sensitive souls have a lot of difficulty with the di difference between reality, the real world, um, and the world that they would want to create, their idealistic world that they would want to create. And they, they have a hard time holding their own value because the, the self that they're always striving to create is one that's quite perfect and sometimes out of reach and uh, with some degree of unrealistic expectations. So they're constantly deciding whether or not um, they have value in any situation. And if they decide that they don't have value in a situation, they're very holistic, they will hold themselves out of it. So, so they're con both of these functions, the, the thinking function and the feeling function, as you know, they're all about deciding and defining, um, but one does it in in more pragmatic, practical way, and the other does it more in that relational way, in in holistic way, because it's connected to our physiology more more profoundly in the nervous system. The other two functions um, where we uh, where we either interpret the world and find meaning or we experience the world, these are just for gathering information. There's no decision making with these functions. The extroverted intuition, I'll talk about that first, it's in the upper right quadrant of the rational brain. And it um, the performer, the extroverted um, intuition has a need to be recognized. And whether it's an ENTP or an ENFP, these are the people who, who love to be on stage. They love an audience. They expand. <laughs> they take something and make it larger than it actually is. If it's an ENFP, they just don't tell you about their feelings. They perform their feelings. And, and so the energy is expansive of this function. With their need to be recognized, it's very difficult for them to be static. And they're always moving toward something beyond what already exists. On the, the introverted side of it, with that need to be perceptive of the INTJ and INFJ, these people live in a type of utopian reality where they see how if we only connected everything up and they, they connect systems and they connect processes and people and they see people at their highest potential and they want to perceive things in that holistic way that, that the right side of the brain does. It's very difficult for the, the this person this um, function when they don't have all the pieces or they can't see a future different from the present. So they they're constantly both of these um, striving styles and the the four personality types of this quadrant. They are constantly taking in information and moving us all in that direction that they see is possible for us to go in. 
And the final one, the final quadrant is the, um, the sensing function, the extroverted sensing, the ESTP and the ESFP. Um, we call it the adventurer because they have a need to be spontaneous. And because this is connected to, uh, again, the left brain and our experiential brain, people of this style are in perpetual motion. They don't want to plan. They want to move. They want to do. They want to, you know, take in more experiences in the world through this function and um, as, as we know about the sensing function, it only takes in information that it can perceive or it can see, touch, taste, feel, and hear. Um, it discards anything that has to do with theory and things outside of the realm of what they can actually experience. Their need to be um, spontaneous is very different than their introverted counterpart, which while they also have a need for experience, they want to make sure that anything that they're doing is secure because they are driven by a need to have things be the same so that they know that they're going to be safe and secure. And it's very hard for them to move out of that place of, I'm taking in information. I know you're telling me about this, but I can't connect it to anything. And so I can't see how I can have this experience because I've never experienced it before. And they're very, they can be very finite in the information that they will take in as credible if they've had limited life experience themselves. So this one is more experiential. So, so you can see that, that the needs have really have something to do with the function and what the function is there for because the need, our, our emotions drive our behavior. Our thoughts don't cause us to behave, <laughs> although we think that our rational brain is stronger. It's actually our emotions that drive our behavior. And when our emotional needs aren't met, <clears throat> then we get into the self-protective aspect of each of these functions of the brain. So the intuitive and the feeling portions of the brain are on the right side, more nonlinear, more artistic in a way. The right brain is known for being a little less linear than the left brain. And then you have the left brain, which is more responsible for the thinking and the sensing. I can see the correlation between the linearity because logic needs a linear if then or cause and effect or a logical pro con. And so there is a level of left brainness in that. And with sensing, it needs that experience. And so it's linear because of the sequential order of how the information is set up. And so very cool. It's nice to see this brain hypothesis. It makes a lot of sense. And so I'm wondering about how you apply the striving styles in organizations and what have been the biggest aha moments? Yeah, ab absolutely. And I, I think this, you, you know, coming at this piece with by understanding needs has been a real game changer for us and for our clients because it, it, it speaks to that place of if I know why you behave the way you do, that gives me the ability to um, when I'm bringing something to you to take that need into consideration. Or if I'm in a circumstance and my behavior is suddenly shifting and maybe it's not as productive as I would like it to be, I can understand why that's happening in me. And then again, I can make a decision to have a different response. And one of the examples that, that we talk about is in particular in, a, in an organization is from a change management perspective is that if I'm dealing with a lot of leaders, ESTJs, ISTJs in particular, so you think about it, they have a need to be in control and they have a need to be secure. So talk about like cementing in from a status quo perspective, right? There's one right way to do it. I know the right way to do it. I'm already doing everything great. And my security and my experience means I just want to keep doing things the way I've always been doing it. So instead of just looking at that and saying, okay, well, you know, these folks, are, maybe they're resistant to change. I look at it from that lens of, and, and Anne and I in our work we, we do is that, it, what do we need to do when we're talking to them, considering our approach presenting in a way that lets them continue to get that need for control to be met and get that need to be secure be met. 
So suddenly we're changing some of our approaches from a communication perspective. We're looking at things in a more simplistic way. And, and uh, you know, one of the examples that we use is if we're trying to drive change in order to get to a desired future state, we actually, with these folks, again, the leader stabilizer, stabilizer leader combination, we don't start the conversation with the vision because that's, an extroverted or introverted intu intuition, and that for them is less developed. So where we start them with is what is the burning platform in their current experience that we can use to move them forward? So the whole methodology gets modified when you really do understand these needs and, and how we move them through, you know, status quo, through their fear and into learning and growth. And, and so that's where, it, you know, it's been really useful. Um, you know, even for me, I always talk about in, in my development because I'm a performer intellectual. Well, just understanding that in my brain, I, I process the information, I make decisions about it, but I don't always come out and be directive about it the way a leader style person does. So that gave me something very tangible to work on in my own leadership development, being cognizant of when I was giving information like, you know, to my kids saying, oh, the dishes in the dishwasher are clean which is informational as opposed to saying to them, you know, empty the dishwasher before you leave the room. So, so by looking at and understanding the needs, but also the way in which we're using these functions and what that means for us, there's an easier developmental path. And we, we work and respond to people differently when we understand where they're coming from and what they need in order to be effective. And so in their system, they like to call you by your hero and parent function. So because I'm an INFJ, my code would be visionary socializer, whereas Anne is an INTJ, so she would be a visionary leader. That's the lingo in case you're wondering how to talk in this striving style language. And um, I like how you sectioned it into four quadrants, because if you want to use typology or a personality framework in an organization, you have to do it by fours. Otherwise, you lose the attention of people who are new to the system. So this is cleverly set up so that you're able to get buy-in from newbies or from people who aren't just type enthusiasts. And so, yeah, it's, it's clever use of the law of four here. And... You talk about these eight functions in relationship to the imposter syndrome too. And so I'm wondering if you could go a little bit into that. Well, in, in talking about the imposter syndrome, um, I'll go back to what Heather said earlier about the, this develop, how, how the brain develops and that we quite often see age as a determinant of how we should behave, but it's actually, actually has more to do with maturing and, and our psychological stability. Um, and first of all, we develop a self-protective system. We develop that persona to make sure that we're adapting appropriately to the world. We fit into our family system and societal rules while maintaining some of our own individuality. And then when we hit uh, our mid to, to late 20s, we start moving more into that time where our authentic self emerges. And, and as our um, authentic self emerges, if we don't have the psychological security to keep growing, we stay in our self-protective system using a particular persona. And, and I'll give you an, the imposter syndrome of the leader, for example, will look very different than the imposter syndrome of the artist. The leader will have to make all of it. And so, so we, they become a hyper, um, how do I say this? They become polarized in their need and the leaders need to be in control means they have to be perfect. They have to know more than everyone else. If they're a leader in an organization, they can't have anyone around them that threatens their competence by challenging them or opposing them at all. And so they become much more autocratic in their imposter syndrome because they don't want anyone to see their vulnerabilities. You know, not that they enjoy exposing their vulnerabilities at the best of, of times because it doesn't come natural to their brain organization. 
The artist, on the other hand, when they're polarized in, in the, their imposter syndrome, they have decided that they're not good enough and they are in search of their fatal flaw constantly, constantly talking about what's wrong with them, believing that other people are victimizing them because of some flaw of their own. And they create so much emotional distress for themselves and so much anxiety in their body as a result of this belief that they, they just aren't good enough. And so, so on the one side, you'll see um, certain personality types with the imposter syndrome is that they will inflate their persona, inflate their value in the outer world while fearing that, in, you, you know, that someone's going to find them out. And then you have other styles that will actually lead with, and they'll tell you in a number of different ways, why they're not good enough, how hard things are for them, you know, if they could only organize themselves and they actually lead with it so that they engage people in always helping and supporting them. So it shows up differently. And in both of them, it's that recognition that if they're stuck in their persona, they can move out of that place and start developing the, the, the capacity of their authentic self to tolerate being human. And we like to talk about it like that because some styles have more difficulty than others. Just, you, you know, like, like performer, visionary, leader, intellectual, you know, I think therefore I am <laughs> sort of, you, you know, I'm fine. It's everybody else that's not keeping up with me and they should be more like me. Um, but that, 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 acceptance of our own humanity, our own vulnerabilities, and being able to grow from where our development left off wherever it was during our formative years. Mm. To add on to what you said, with the leader, they tend to push feelings aside to get the job done. And so there is wanting to not indulge their weaknesses or their emotions or things that get them out of control and prevent them from getting things done from doubling down on the in control tendencies, you naturally leave a deficit in the other part of your personality. And on the other hand, with the artist, when you double down on introverted feeling too much, you become someone who indulges in curved bullets. So seeing everything as an attack on the self, like taking everything personally. I don't mean to say that for all FI users, just for the ones that are in the the darker states of introverted feeling. So for an ISFP who is in the subway, for instance, they might think, oh, everyone's judging me or they, they make things about me. And so when it really isn't, and so it creates this accidental victimizing mentality as Anne talked about. And so I was wondering about the imposter syndrome for the socializer, if you don't mind going into that. Sure. The um, so so again, the when you look at it from the that perspective of their the extroverted feeling function and that need to be connected, and and part of that is about you know when they're working out of their imposter syndrome or out of their imposter syndrome persona, they go into this place of being excessively helpful. Right. And so I'm, you know, and, and they see their value as human beings as being connected to how helpful can I be to these to these other people. And so what ends up happening is that they're if they don't get that feedback in terms of that appreciation or that recognition or really being seen by others, it then further causes them to feel like uh, they're not good enough, right? And then they, they end up working harder and harder. And again, much like we talked about and talked about with the introverted feeling function or the artist, the extroverted feeling function, they're also at risk of not um, you know, not holding boundaries for themselves, right? Not protecting and considering what do I need? Because if they're putting all of their energy out for everyone else, then they can find themselves in states of exhaustion and overwhelm and, you know, get overcommitted to things. And, and that's, again, when how we know they're working from their imposter syndrome persona. And a little bit of that martyring starts to come in, right? As I do everything for everyone and nobody ever appreciates me. And, uh, you know, and, and it becomes really 
really problematic in their relationships from that perspective because there can be an element of keeping score, right? Um, that goes on in that in that dynamic because again, they're always focused on and. We sort of laugh sometimes because with, you know, with the socializer and again, all of this is without judgment. It's really from that place of understanding is that they they are so wired to um, be helpful that they will think they're doing something or telling you something in order to be helpful. That really isn't what you need or what you want in that particular moment to, to truly help you. And, and so because of that, sometimes the, where they move into is it doesn't have that impact on others. And then they don't get that appreciation, as I said. Um, and then they start to go back into that, that mental spin of the imposter syndrome is I'm not good enough and there's something wrong with me. And so, so again, it's, it's different and how it, um, shows up in their interactions, their relationships at work um, is different from, you know, what we see in the introverted feeling function. Yeah, very well put. And so the stabilizer and the socializer can have traits that seem martyr-like for different reasons. For the FE Dom, they love to help people because they love that connection and, and wanting to help people is something that comes naturally. It also comes naturally to the stabilizer too, because they feel a sense of responsibility for maintaining whatever's there. And so they can both complain about helping people too much or doing too much, but in different ways. And so this is just to illustrate that the same behavior can be done from two different motivations too. With the socializer, it's interesting. Some people see it as the most extroverted cognitive function, but here's another way to see it too. Sometimes socializers help people excessively so much they can actually develop an internal resentment because the thing that they enjoy the most is actually connecting with people. And so when they spend the whole time taking on favors or helping people, they might actually want to introvert because they're like, man, people never connect with me afterwards or it's never fulfilling because they don't, they don't reciprocate. And so after a while, you might even have socializers who see themselves as introverted because they get burnt out from socializing because they're not doing the part of socializing that they enjoy, which is the connecting. They're doing the errand running and they're doing the responsibility taking. Someone can be a socializer and may identify with the need to be connected, but they may not see themselves as super social because they're jaded as a human being and traumatized by helping people so much. They're like, I, I need my own time because whenever there are people there, I always put myself last. And so I just need to separate myself from people so that I don't put my needs last, which is my internal compulsion to always do. And so there's a phenomenon for high extroverted feeling users, which is called self-fracturing. They honor your needs or they honor your preferences so much that they self-fracture their own preferences or they don't look at their own needs or they don't think about their own emotions in favor of taking care of you. And so over time, FJ types can feel fractured yeah. by taking care of people. So, so if I can comment on that, because it's a really good, um, good um, point, Joyce, that you're making. It's that if you think about people who are have to have to use their function um, because they are dependent on others to get their needs met as opposed to I choose who to um, help and who not to help relative to my energy levels which that sort of thinking comes more from the authentic self but anyone with a narcissistic wound who got stuck in their development who's operating just from their self-protective persona, it's like they don't have a choice, you see, because they're not developed up enough where they feel entitled to say no. And, and so this is where, you, you know, from a psychological perspective in talking about the ENFJ or the ESFJ, they, they are so pulled out because their, their fear is, if I don't do this, I will be abandoned. And this deep fear of abandonment that comes from that early wounding um, is a is a core driver of their behavior, and they don't see that need to, you know, I have to I have to get unstuck from operating from this place and learn how to boundary and say no. And if I can just say one one more thing about that, how astute. Um, you, you know, you you are in terms of your under your understanding of this, but but just that difference between extroverted feeling and extroverted thinking, 
is one needs to be connected. The extroverted feeling is a social function. It needs to bond. But most of the leaders that we've worked with, if you ask them what they do in their spare time, they're still being useful. They have a need to be used and they're still doing, they're working in their garage, they're coaching their kids' teams. And, and so their extroversion is more of a doing as opposed to a relating activity. It's just, they're both energized in that same way. And, and to, the, to my, my earlier point about when they're self-protective, they can't turn off. I have, um, I have a leader stabilizer client who listens to the CBC on her headphones when she's sleeping because she can't turn her brain off. And the only way that she can sleep. And so these are people who are actually trapped because they can't get out of their self-protective persona. They're not psychologically safe enough. That is beautifully put. And so what Anne is describing is being trapped in your extroverted psychological persona, which is the leader and the socializer. They are out of tune with themselves and they don't feel like they have a choice to be in tune with themselves. And so the growth path is getting more in tune with your internal world. So I enjoy your explanation there, Anne. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit about the stabilizer and the adventurer in terms of their imposter syndrome. Oh, the, these are both experiential ones. Um, the, the, he, he, so I'll talk about them. They're, they're actually quite different in what I said earlier about the adventurer being their need to be spontaneous is they, ha they have to keep moving in order for nobody to see that they're, they're really not good at what they're doing or, or they move past their feelings. Their relationship to their emotions is one of at a distance. They just don't take the time to sit and reflect on it. And if they do have thoughts about, you know, I'm not good enough, they'll just leave and do something else when they're in, in their self-protective persona or when they're in their imposter syndrome. So, so ESTPs, um, ESFPs, they will just move away from it and move away from the feelings instead of addressing them. That's why it's so infrequent to have this particular personality type do any therapy at all. Um, the introverted side of it, the introverted sensing, what ISFJs and um, ISTJs do is we call it going behind the wall. <laughs> and that, you know, it, all of their fears and, and all of their doubts and all of their concerns is they're emotionally behind the wall while they're so busy doing more and more and more and more to prove their value and worth. And it's, it's actually not value, it's their usefulness that consumes them, that they must be useful. And if they stop being useful, their fear is that they'll be cast aside and rejected. And, and so you have these, it's a very moving, uh, moving the energy moving away from feelings. One's hiding out and then the other one is just running away so that nobody can see what they're actually feeling. Or nobody can see or, or um, hold them to in the conversation long enough to actually ask them or talk to them about what's going on. Beautifully said. And so with the adventurer, these types, they live in the moment. And so how this can show up in a negative manifestation is the miserable now. And so because they're most right now, if they feel like in the moment is miserable, they project that into the future and see it as a forever. It's, it's always going to be miserable because right now it feels miserable or it's not working right now. So it'll never work. And so to prevent the miserable now, they just escape that negative feeling altogether. So instead of thinking about all the baggage in the future or all the baggage in the past, they, they're like, okay, I'm just going to go in the moment, but in a, in a positive moment so that I don't have to go into this inescapable miserable now. So it's escaping the negative manifestation of the extroverted sensing, feeling like if it's not happening now, it'll never happen. That's bang on what you're saying, because we talk about the uh, avoidant dysfunction, avoidant personality dysfunction, and most adventurers and stay, um, e, the, most people who operate from this quadrant, they either, they use coping strategies. 
and and so the the addictions of the adventurer of the risk taking the you know the seeking as you said Joyce of those pleasurable feelings to escape the difficult feelings that they're having in their life very common for them yeah the adventurer has two modes it's either everything's going to work itself out we'll cross that bridge when we get there and it'll work out when we get there or this is the miserable now and it will never work out. I see it in the future. The future just feels like the right now, so nothing will go well. So they, they want to prevent the other alternative that's negative because they don't know how to cope with it. So they go to the positive, which is, uh, let's just live in this different moment because uh, <laughs> it's too overwhelming to deal with the miserableness of the entire existence that I'm starting to feel because they have the visionary on the other side. And so their visionary is mostly based on the present moment. And so they're like, the only vision I see is the sad future that I feel in this current moment. So let's not go there. So it's avoidance of the visionary side of them in that sense. So maybe that's getting too complicated. There is the stabilizer too. And so if you double down on the stabilizer too much, what can happen is you have someone who projects negatively if things don't go according to the routine or to the template or to the rules. And so if things are destabilized, it creates a lot of anxiety in the stabilizer. It might even create controlling tendencies, especially if it's paired with the leader. So if they're a stabilizer leader, it might create a, okay, you have to actually put all your ducks into a row and, and do it this way, or else it's gonna spiral out into these negative possibilities. And so to give themselves an inner sense of calm or comfort, they need things to feel stable or else there is this need to control, especially if it's with the leader preference too. And so, yeah, the, those are how things can, can turn out. There's stabilizers have a certain form of ways that they think things should be to work out like a template or a recipe. And if they're not given the parameters for something, it can make them feel like they're spiraling. They don't know what to do or that like a blank page with no parameters is too much for them. So they need some sort of specificity or detail to move forward. And it, it can generate a immense sense of discomfort if not given some clarity. They can be okay with change as long as you give them very detailed specific parameters for how it's gonna happen. Otherwise it can feel destabilizing for them. And so the dark side of stabilizer is destabilized. And so Anne and Heather, I was wondering about the imposter syndrome of the visionary and the performer. So again, we're looking at, you know, the, the intuitive function and, it, you know, when you think about, um, you know, where, where both of these folks go because their brains are wired to be really expansive, right? And so looking at the possibilities and all of the options and when they're struggling with feelings of not being good enough, where we see them going is, you know, one is we talk about this notion of prostituting themselves in essence. So where they're, you know, um, not holding their value, they are, you know, sort of working um, over time and working harder than everybody else. And just in order to prove that they're, they're good enough, that they are putting themselves in situations where they start shrinking their world back. So instead of living a life that's expansive and growth oriented and, you know, I'm going to go from one level to the next to the next from a perspective of mastery, they hold themselves back. Right. And they, you know, it's sort of that, you know, know your place and stay small. And who do you think you are? And so that's the push pull we see always with, between the intuitive function. That is the most their predominant function. And of course, they're, you know, they're less developed or their least developed function of the sensing. Right. And, and they get into this struggle in their brains and because because they can see it, right? They can see it, but with the imposter syndrome comes in all of that self-doubt. And then they start doing things that, um, you know, because they don't, they're not as connected to the experiential function is they don't stay in the course of things. So there's the absence of follow through on their vision, that self-sabotage, that lack of self-care that gets triggered in with these folks that are struggling with the imposter syndrome. And so, you, you know, that that element where when we work with these folks in particular, Nan and I, will, we talk about it all the time with our clients, having both 
navigated our own development through the imposter syndrome, right? Is that, you know, despite what we know and what we see, we hold it back, right? Because we don't want anyone to feel like, you know, we're we're too we're too much. We don't want that feedback. That's usually the feedback that we get when we're little, um, <laughs> as we're growing up. That that lays some of that foundation work from uh, in terms of the imposter syndrome. So so it's looking at it through that lens of you know if you are you know EN, ENTP ENFP INTJ INFJ. It's that the imposter syndrome is really going to show up where or you know that you're struggling with the imposter syndrome if you're in that place of holding back yourself back from actually going after what it is that you're envisioning, but also putting so much work constantly um, and taking on things and agreeing to things and, you know, taking on jobs for lower wages and, and agreeing to be in these places where, you, you know, if I just keep proving myself, then eventually I'm going to be seen as being good enough. But that get, continues to keep us in that self-protective state of the imposter syndrome and working out of the persona, as opposed to really moving into our authentic self where we can hold our value, where we can negotiate for it, where we don't worry about people feeling like we are you know, too far ahead of everyone else, but we learn to work to connect back up with people. Yeah. And so the intuitive functions are people who have strong intuition. A lot of them deal with odd duck syndrome or ugly duckling syndrome. So in some way, they might feel fundamentally different than the people around them growing up. And so they know they have to work extra hard to prove themselves or they know that like with intuition or abstraction, you can't always prove it concretely right away. And so there can be the realizing that other people don't see what you see or make the connections that you make or see the meaning underneath everything that you do. And so there might be this need for overcompensation in that area. So I could see that, Heather. And so I am wondering, did we go over the intellectual? Maybe briefly, but I was wondering if there's a specific imposter syndrome for that one. For the intellectual, it, it, if they don't feel... Um, like they know enough. Um, and uh, of course, with, with all of the in, uh, predominant introverted functions, they tend to go inward, um, trying to figure out how to get back to getting their need met. And so, so they can, an intellectual, for example, can know that they have all of the information that they need to do their job but if they're in a meeting and they're already suffering from the imposter syndrome and somebody comes up with something that they, they haven't thought of or they don't know, they can either become oppositional or combative or they will go into themselves um, and blame themselves and get really down on themselves for not having all of the information it's especially intps with the i should have seen it you know <laughs> because they have performer as their second function i should have seen it i should have known it um it, it's as though if they if they're not the expert they are nobody and of course all of the imposter syndrome personas they all have that all or nothing um involve you you know that i i'm either perfect or i'm nothing i'm either in control or i'm out of control i'm either secure or you know the sky is falling <laughs> you know i'm catastrophizing and so the intellectual they they as we know they can go either way in terms of making the other person wrong so that they remain right or just going inside and beating themselves up. You don't really know with the intellectual because you know, unlike other styles, they they really are distanced from they have a very distant relationship to how they feel. And so they have an, a way of rationalizing and dismissing other people, or they'll dismiss themselves if they they're feeling um if if they don't have all of the information that that they need or they don't think they have all the information that they need they can dismiss themselves and not say anything at all and so you really do get that you know they're either out there putting other people down or dismissing them or they're dismissing themselves and doubting themselves and thinking they should know everything 
Yeah, so that's a really good point about the all or nothingness we have when we're in our persona. And this could cause a lot of negative spiraling for these types or show up in the form of biting them later in life. So perhaps a lot of people's midlife crises is, is for some of them, it's doubling down on their tendencies and then realizing after a while, it's not working. It's not solving all of my problems because our dominant tendency tends to be the hammer that we strike every nail in our life with. And then we realize, hey, that might not be the best tool for some problems that we have. And then we learn to back off and use other things in our toolbox instead. And it also helps us realize that we're different. So we don't need to expect people to be like us. Like there might be some leader types that wonder why other types aren't efficient or effective or get things done. It's like, it's like, are you purposefully wasting my time? Are you purposefully making this inefficient? Do you purposefully not care? Is that why you're not doing this well? So if we don't know that other people aren't like us, we might just interpret their behavior as they just don't care. And that might make us even more irritated because we think that their actions come out of maliciousness rather than ignorance and not being able to think like we think. And so models like this give us a form of compassion with ourselves and with other people. Neurodiversity exists and that's okay. So my question for you two is, you like to link this to brain science or how the brain works, the cognitive functions. So I'm wondering if you have any books or resources to supplement it so people, if they're curious, they can look it up. Well, we do have our book, um, Who Are You Meant to Be? Um, so we wrote that book based on, and it outlines uh, the science behind the striving styles, uh, goes into more information about each one of the eight um, styles, it talks about how we need to learn not to do, use the predominant one, uh, but the fact that we are intended as human beings to be able to use all four of the quadrants, but it is a developmental path in order to be able to get there. But when, by understanding which four of the styles in what are on what we call our striding style squad. So for example, as an ENTP, minds, performer, intellectual, socializer, stabilizer. So by understanding kind of how I'm supposed to use each one of those what they do when they're being self-protective or if they're less developed, how that shows up for me. So our book, Who Are You Meant to Be?, which is available on at, at Amazon, um, in, you know, really helps you sort of get into it and start to work it. What we also really like about the book is that there's a whole roadmap for development that's included in the book. So you can get started on trying to start that plan for how are you going to develop uh, the style that is in each one of your four quadrants so that you can become more integrated in leveraging the full potential and capacity of your brain, not just those one or two that are already hardwired for you to use effectively. And if I can just add to that, in the book, we in, in the introduction in the book, we reference all of the people whose theories and work before us we referenced in, in the creating of this system, in including Spiri and Catherine Benziger and Herman's brain dominance and a number of different theorists that we brought together when we were, in, of course, with the foundational young, <laughs> um, and, and his psychological types, but how we weaved all of these theories together to come up with this um, theory and system. Very cool indeed. So I will have their book linked below. And so thank you for coming out and feel free to check out Striving Styles and they have a podcast too, if that appeals to you. And I'm thankful to have you both on today. It was a delight. Thanks so much, Joyce. A really great time having this conversation with you. Thanks for having us. Yes. Thank you, Joyce. And so thank you everyone for watching. I'll see you all in the next episode. Mm -hmm. Thank you.